and welcome to the Naked Podcaster, Stripping with My Daughter. I'm Jen, the mom and host of the Naked Podcaster. And I'm Alana. I'm the daughter and co-host. We're sharing our insight on tough topics from the perspective of the parent and the child. I'm so glad you joined us on this journey. Let's get started. Hello, welcome to the Naked Podcaster, Stripping with My Daughter. I'm Jen Taylor. And I'm Alana Bills. And today we're talking about, what are we talking about, Alana? We are talking about disciplining teenagers and how to like parent them and how to transition them from being a teenager to a functioning adult. <laughs> I, use the ter- I use the term functioning very loosely. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we're going to try to be really careful not to mention any of the kids' names because out of 18... I've gotten 12 to adulthood. A couple others, I had a huge part in that. Um, And two are not quite, well, three aren't adults yet, but two of them are almost. So there's 16 kids. There's 14 kids that I will have done. Like I'm really, really 100% involved. Two that I was a little bit less involved, but had a huge impact. Um, So with almost 16 kids, with about 16 kids that I've gotten to adulthood, um, I'm going to, and, and Alana and I are using our chat here. Um, Oh, we are. (laughs) Ah, found it. I'm very tech savvy. That's true. You are. So, Yes, I have experience, and Alana, you were one of those kids, but also, as the kid gets kind of in the middle, you have had the benefit of watching the kids older than you transition. Oh, it's fun. And younger than you transition. So, let's jump into the joy of you guys being teenagers. So, the perk of being in the middle is I see where the older kids mess up and, like, how they recover. And then I get to watch the younger kids struggle because they're too young to remember it. Some of them, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, although they could, they could tap into some of that if they wanted to. So the two that are not quite adults might not remember it specifically. Right. But they can still use them as resources. True. Don't you think? Well, yeah, but... There's some older siblings that are old enough to where I haven't even talked to them true, true. in years. Right. Because, like, last time I saw them, I was in, like, That's first true. grade kindergarten. That's true. But those are kind of like the kids that age out of foster care and stuff, those extra five. True. Of that core 13, there's 12 of you within 10 years, you know? Yeah, I, I did see most of that. Okay, so let's talk about some of the standard things that have occurred as, I don't want to say behavior issues, but unique behaviors in teenage years. And I'm going to, I'm, we can just like spitball this list. So suicide attempts and cutting is one. Uh huh. Drug and alcohol use is another. Sneaking out is another. Jump in here if you can think of any. Just that snotty attitude of, I'm almost an adult, you're my parent, and you're old, you don't have a clue, it wasn't like this when you were young, and you're an asshole, mm-hmm. so I don't want to listen. But yeah, that happens. Right. you know, you didn't experience being 16 with a cell phone. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's the struggles, mom. (laughs) You know what? That's actually an excellent point. I was not a teenager in the same, with the same situations. And I think as parents, our experiences, like my experience when I was a teenager compared to my kids, they are different experiences. There's a different, but I understand what it's like to be bullied, Mm -hmm. but not cyber bullied, but I understand that. Well, yeah. But like, even now, like when I was 13, the stuff I was doing is completely different than the 13 year olds now. Like some of the 13 year olds, if they put on makeup, they look older than me. And I'm just like, I can drink. You're in middle school. Right. So it's just so 
different. So kids are growing up really now. fast. Yeah, it is. It's, oh, yeah. It's changing fast and kids are growing up fast. So as a parent, the only thing that I would say the kids could say, like, you don't understand what it's like, is that you guys do have, it's a different world for you than it was mm-hmm. for me. That does not mean that I didn't you- have the same pressures. True. But okay. your pressures were applied in a different way format essentially do you think that makes a big difference sometimes yeah because it depends on situations drinking drugs sex um depression bullying these are all issues that i experienced like you experienced you Mm -hmm. you i think that they're harder for you i think that they're more for you in a way yes because now we do have little computers in our pockets all the time and we can get contacted instantly. So we can't always escape it. We can't just go home and not have to worry about anything until the next morning because it follows us everywhere. So that makes it harder. Because it's a constant pressure for you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there's no breaks. So we tend to give in more because we don't get an escape from the pressure, and it's easier to give in and just become a part of it and get swept away with the flow than to constantly go against it. Okay. So it's a, you have more pressure and it's more of the time. You know, the other thing I think is interesting is when I read an article recently on the endorphins in your brain, when someone likes a post you guys have like this push button trigger of endorphins that you want more of. So on social media, if you post something and people click the like button, you want the likes. Yeah. Yeah, (laughs) (laughs) I thought that meant to have sex twice when I first heard it. (laughs) Well, or it it was a threesome (laughs) or like, (laughs) (laughs) I'm like double tap. We're talking about a threesome. All right. No, yeah. it means you like it. So I know, someone I know. says, I'll double tap that ass. Or, but, oops. No, yes. Then, this, is, this is adult, Alana. Oh, well, you can say ass. I'm used to filtering myself around you. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, like, so I've, had, I've heard someone say, I'd like to double tap that ass. Which, it can be taken a couple different ways. Like, I really like your ass. But I've also been told it means, like, you have a really... How do I put this in a basically a, a fuckable ass? Right. As I've well, I mean, I have both. I think both would apply to me if anyone said it. Well, so. Yeah. <laughs> so the thing with parents is that because this was something that I had to learn what double tapping meant, right? It wasn't <laughs> what I initially thought. Mm-hmm. And that there's an endorphin rush in our kids when you're constantly, when things are being liked. And on the same regard, on the same line, when things are not liked, we get upset. It's a depression issue. Like, I've, I, that's why I just, I'm not real big on social media because, like, I have, like, next to no followers. And whenever I post stuff, I'll be like, guys, I got 15 likes. And they're just like, oh, you poor thing. And I'm just like, no, that's like the most likes I've gotten. And then they're just like, oh, I have like 200 plus normally. So it just makes it difficult to like put yourself out there and be like, hey guys, look at all these adventures I'm going on. Look at all these things I'm doing. And if you're not very popular, like I was never popular. So I like still am not popular so I never get the likes and like at first I was just like oh I got 12 likes well I'm like the 250th like on your post and you're the 11th on mine right like it it can be disheartening but that's why Instagram's new thing like they're gonna block how many likes there are on posts so if you see something and you don't like it you don't like it because you see there's all these other likes and then only the person that posts it can see it. And I think that would be interesting to see how it would happen. Like how the likes fluctuate, would it stay the same or would it change? I'm pretty do you sure think, it would change. Do you think people 
click the like on Instagram because they genuinely like it or because they want to be part of the masses or because they have a lot so then they don't want to click it because they don't want to contribute to someone else's popularity. Could it be all of those things? It, I'm pretty sure it's all of those. So if I see your post and I have no idea how many people like it, you think if I like it, it's coming from a more genuine place. It's not mm -hmm. about the number. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. So let's talk about when you were a teenager and discipline. Oh, it's a fun topic. Well, I know by the time you got to me, you were kind of just like, yeah, sure, you're an adult. Let's see what happens. And you were kind of just like, there was a four-year-old in the house and a whole bunch of chaos all the time. A lot of there teenagers. A lot of teenagers. A lot teenagers. of teenagers, yeah. And I was, I was one of the older ones. So you're just like, set the example. And I'm just like, I'll set it from a distance. And I would always like, I'm not going to lie, I snuck out probably a lot more often than you knew of mm -hmm. and like I would just I wouldn't wouldn't always go and do bad things like most of the time I just snuck out because like I need to be in my own space away from everything I'd leave my phone so you couldn't track me but I would bring or I would turn it off and put it on airplane mode unless just in case I got lost because that happened once I got really badly lost and I would just wander around in my own headspace so I could have privacy and my own bubble but I was walking around in the middle of the night as a really tiny teenager right because so, you're you're like five foot two how tall are I'm, you I'm five four and a half <laughs> Don't take those two inches, two and a half inches from me, mom. I worked hard for them. So this was my policy with stuff like that, with you guys sneaking out. Um, I knew that you guys all did it. I didn't really keep track or have well, yeah. alarms. But I, this is how I feel about it. And I wasn't different for like... Because you're 21 and Bree's 27. So of if you, if you take out of the picture the five extra kids, and we're just talking about the 13 like core kids, mm -hmm. um, then you guys, it was a, you were in very close proximity. There were, there were 12 kids in 10 years. There were a lot of teenagers. And I didn't treat the older ones really any different than the younger ones. My philosophy was... I could give you all these rules and all these structure and you could go out your bedroom window or walk out the front door. Once I'm asleep, I'm asleep. I mean, unless you're mm -hmm. making enough noise, you have the ability to be quiet and leave the house and snort a line of Coke in my front yard. <laughs> yeah, I mean, realistically, right. You'd probably use the could. backyard. Right. So well, yeah, the backyard. See I, <laughs> well, you're more <laughs> hidden, you know, from the neighbors. Well, yeah. My philosophy was, and is, that um, if you wanted to do that, you were going to find a way regardless. find a way to do it. So I'm not going to ground you and all that shit because it seems so counterproductive. It actually makes you want to sneak out more because the whole sneaking out and doing stuff you're not supposed to is so that it's like you're showing me. You're going against the rules. You're doing something you think right. I don't like. Um, so if you put more rules, there's more for us to go against. And then we just I felt that find way. sneakier ways. Right. And, and, you know, teenagers, people in general are extremely resourceful. Oh, yeah. So you're going, if you really, really want to do something, you're going to figure out a way. And the more roadblocks I give, I put in front of you, the, the more, more dedicated. Right. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So... It's not that I didn't care that you were sneaking out because I always was concerned that you would get yourself into a situation that was that you couldn't get yourself out of. And um, like not taking your phone is not what I wanted, not because I would have tracked you. Um, I wouldn't have tracked you unless something had but happened. So if something happened, I'd be able to call. Right. And, and not necessarily me. I've told all you guys growing up, if you have a teacher or a counselor or a best friend's parent, I wanted, I was always, I wanted to be super open. So you felt like you could talk to me about anything, knowing that sometimes there were going to be consequences. But if you call me from a party, shit face drunk and want to be picked up, 
I'm going to come pick you up. up. Right. And I'm going to tuck you into bed and give you a bowl to throw up in. And I'm going to go back to sleep. That doesn't mean Mm -hmm. that there aren't going to be consequences or we're not going to have a discussion about it. But it meant that I wanted you guys to all know you could come to me. I also knew that I was not always going to be the person that was that you felt the most comfortable coming to. And I'm okay with that. I wanted you to go to someone, even if it wasn't me, knowing it could be me. So it's not that I didn't care that you snuck out. Um, It's just you wanted us to be safe when we were sneaking. I I wanted you to be safe. Exactly. I wanted you to be safe. That's that's exactly I always kept like a knife or pepper spray on myself because like I know I can't throw a punch. And even if I did, there's not much weight behind it. Literally. Right. So... Like, I would always have pepper spray or a knife on me so that if I were to get into any sort of situation, I'd have at least some line of defense. Even if it's, you know, not the best. But. So, sneaking out and drinking and doing drugs, I think, I didn't want you to do it. I knew you probably would. and. I, I don't think I ever grounded anyone um, or took away your phone. I mean, I've limited phones before, mm-hmm. but I think you hit a certain age, that 16 plus, where you are almost an adult. And I wanted to allow you to make enough mistakes yourself and have the ability to come to me that you could ease into being an adult. Instead of, I could have put alarms on windows and doors. I could have had a (laughs) lockdown, right? We could have turned it into the prison. Then we just would have gotten sneakier. Like, right? In one of our houses, if you went to the closet, got into the crawl space, I knew for a fact that there was a hole that would pop me up in the neighbor's backyard. Which house was that? That's awesome. I know, right? Um, It was Piper. I mean. Oh, really? Oh, cool. Yeah, I mean, that's I cool. I've been the one to put the hole there, but I mean, I knew it was there. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so the thing is, is that exactly, you get sneakier and more angry. Yeah. There's a lot more tension. I'm not saying not parent your kids. We had conversations. I mean, we talked in our last podcast about the things that were important and traditions were and having discussions at dinner without technology. Mm-hmm. And we really, really tried to do a lot with you and spend as much time as we could and have really open conversations. And about you being an adult, I never wanted to like put my thumb on you and then send you out when you're, well, and then I send you out when you're 18 and I'm like, good luck. Yeah, because that's just how people end up living in their parents' basement until they're like 32. (laughs) Or, or, or they just... You go out on your own, right, and then, like, you do all the things you were never allowed to do. And, you know, if you go out at 18, you're a legal adult and do all the things you were never allowed to do, that typically ends with someone in jail, and usually it's you. Well, not, like, you as a parent, but, like, it's the person. So, what were we talking about that one day? I remember, oh, we were talking about sex one day. Um, because we were just having normal conversation and it somehow slipped out that I, I wasn't a virgin. <gasps> yes. And you were just like, well, I'd rather you don't do that. Cause I was like 16 at the time. And you're just like, I'd rather you don't have sex, but since I can't stop you, you might as well be the most badass motherfucker out there doing it. So yep. let me teach you a few things. And you knew you couldn't stop me, so instead you taught me the safest, best, fun way to do it. Right. So that I could, I was still doing it, but I was doing it the safe, fun way. That was mother approved. <laughs> I did always make it clear that I did not want you. I am not excited. I don't want, and you know what you guys never saw. And when we're discussing it like this, it seems like it was always calm and perfect, which it wasn't. I, I, I know looking back on my parenting, the thing that I did is kids emotionally trigger me as a mom, my kids who I love more than anything in the world that I don't even have words to describe. 
trigger my emotions more than any other person. A relationship doesn't do that. A friendship doesn't do that. Kids trigger more emotionally. And I know that in the heat of the moment, I raise my voice. If I could go back and change my parenting, it would be, and I don't know that I was yelling a lot, but I know I'm a very loud personality and I know my emotions were triggered. And so if we call that yelling, that's fine. I didn't handle it well in the moment always. Mm -hmm. Well, not everyone does handle everything well in the moment when things are just thrown at them. And when you talk loud, like I know this goes for me too, because I'm loud just like you, but when you talk loud, it does sound like you yell. Right. But then if you were to yell, you'd be like, oh, that wasn't the loud voice. (laughs) (laughs) I remember... (laughs) I remember uh, like a couple times um, I got accused by one of your brothers, like, you're yelling at me. And I absolutely was not. I mean, oh, I know. Mean, I, I remember mean, this. And, and I turned around and let it rip. And by letting it rip, I was like, you want to hear yelling? This is yelling. This is me mad. This is me. Okay, that's the difference. That you were was- so mad. You were cr- like crying. Yeah. And I was just like, this is terrifying. I'm glad that's not me. I'm just going to close the door, but keep it cracked so I can still watch. I think that as kids, you liked to accuse me like, okay, we're, we're going to talk about how mom yells too much. You know, you want to throw blame at the parent. And well, naturally. like I was, I was not, I was not yelling too much. Yes, I am loud. I am passionate, but kids trigger. So I, I want to make it clear. I didn't always handle myself the way I would like. Um, Neither did us kids. No, but that's your job. And the biggest thing was volume. And the other thing is that there were a lot of times I think I handled it well and went into the bathroom waiting. Like, you know where you think you're going to throw up? but it just never happens. And you just feel, yeah, there were situations that made me literally nearly vomit and definitely cry a lot. And that's the the back end side that kids don't see. And not that it would make a difference to you in the moment, but like emotionally being triggered, even if I kept myself calm, when your daughter is talking to you at 16 about having sex and I want to have a totally calm, mellow, logical conversation about how I really feel about it but emotion emotionally inside Mm -hmm. it's turmoil and as a parent I felt like it was my job to separate the logic and emotion how I really feel about you at 16 having sex is that I don't want you to do it but if you are the only thing I can stop is pregnancy and And STDs I well, I no. I can stop you from getting pregnant. I can tell you to use a com- condom. Mm-hmm. We can have an STD conversation. I can't force you in the heat of the moment to use the condom. The only thing I can prevent with fair certainty is pregnancy. Not only that, often for for girls who are teenagers having sex, it's uncomfortable, and you expect it to be uncomfortable the first couple times. But when it's uncomfortable Mm -hmm. past that, so I tell you, if it's uncomfortable, it's because you're going too fast. You may want to have sex, but you're not physically ready. You need to use lube. You know, I mean, like, Mm -hmm. I have no problem discussing how to keep your body safe and healthy and comfortable. Right. Well, I said you prevent STDs because... Your thing was, I don't want you to have sex as a teen. Well, for me anyways, I'm not sure. Well, for all, any of it. No, it was well, yeah. for all of them, everybody. But for me, you were just like, you have normal flow. Everything is good to go. So I'm not going to give you birth control until you're an adult because I don't want you to have sex. So if you're going to do it and you want to avoid a pregnancy, you have to use condoms. And then as soon as I was 18, you're just like, all right. Here's some birth control because you're not having a kid before you're 21. Yeah. Well, and I think I try to really educate myself and in that process, educate you about the different kinds of birth control. And 
um, you know, for the girls, I like the Mirena IUD a lot because it interferes with your hormones the least amount. And for me, as a woman who went through infertility and has a couple kids with issues in that department, I want to mess with your system as little as possible hormonally. So I want you to be educated. I also want it to last as long as possible and have the best efficacy rate. Mm -hmm. And, and like in this conversation with discipline, the IUD is the best in my opinion. So right. you don't have to remember a pill. You don't have to get a shot every three months. It's not screwing with your system. You don't have to worry about getting pregnant for a few years. It, you know, it's, it's going to be the most effective at preventing pregnancy. It does not prevent STDs. And the same thing with the boys. I mean, with the boys, it's so different because you're not dealing with hormones and cycles and stuff like that. It's more a conversation no. of, you know, you have a lot of sisters and you need to respect that girls are a lot more emotional and sex doesn't feel for them the way it feels for you. You're awarded. Yeah. A, a, a guy is going to have an orgasm like pretty much 100% of the time. time. Right. And it's, it's going to feel good. Girls. No. And so you really need to be more tuned in emotionally and you need to wrap it because it's your responsibility. I mean, I've taught all of you guys keep condoms in your purse or your pocket. I still to this day always have at least one or two condoms on me. If, if you're going to decide to have sex, you want to be prepared and you should never expect the other person to be. So I'm a pretty, yeah. probably in parenting, I would say I'm exceptionally relaxed but I, I try to do things on the front end. Would you agree with that? Yeah. I educate you. I talk to you. Well, I have yeah, open conversations. I, you know we're going to do stuff. So once you find out we're doing it, you make sure we're not being dumb about it like most teens are because they simply don't know. So you always make sure we know as much as we can about a situation as soon as we start getting into it. Same thing with drugs and alcohol. Here's the thing. As a human being, this has nothing to do with being a parent. As a human being that experiences stress, I understand 100% why you would want to escape. And drugs and alcohol, mm -hmm. in my mind, are a way to escape. Oh, yeah. For a few hours. Right. Do I think it's healthy? No. No. <laughs> Um, do I think you can abuse it? And do I think you lose control oh, yeah. over your decisions? Right, right, right. Yeah. Okay. So again, I think I always try to tell you guys, I don't want you to drink and do drugs. I do understand the desire to escape, which was a big thing with running with me and why I really taught you guys, if you eat healthy and you exercise, you can have escapes in a lot of really healthy ways. Yeah. That doesn't mean you didn't without, try them. Without, her, well, no. Sometimes you got to try stuff for the experience just so you, I think it's easier. I think most teens nowadays will try it at least once just for the experience so they can relate easier to other people. Especially now that like marijuana is becoming legal, more people want to try it just to experience it. And then they can relate to all the conversations about it and all the people that do it regularly. They can be like, oh, yeah, I've tried it. And instead of being the one that's just like, no, I'm a complete and total straight edge. I have absolutely no idea what you're talking about. See, I didn't think I was a straight edge and I've never smoked weed. I want to. I haven't. Well a straight edge is someone who's never done any drug. Right. So I want to talk first, especially, this is so cool that it's you, about alcohol. Because when you were in school, you had to write a paper. Well, no, it wasn't a paper. It was a debate. A debate. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You had a debate that you had to prepare for. Tell us about your debate with alcohol. Because I loved it, I, actually. <laughs> oh, so did my class. Um, he decided to go reverse alphabetical. So I was like one of the last people to pick it. So I, I got stuck on the side against 
lowering the drinking age to 18. So I had to find some reason why we shouldn't lower it to 18 in the state of Nevada. So I was just like, well, let's look at some laws. So I, like, I didn't intend to get this fully involved in a debate because I was just like, I'm on, like, the worst team out of all of this. And I was with some people who didn't really care because, well, it was not the ideal side. Everyone wanted to be for lowering the drinking age. But I looked into, like, the state laws and everything pertaining to drinking, and I found out that in the state of Nevada, it is completely legal to start drinking at 16 if you only drink wine, and 18 for any alcohol, as long as you have one parent permission, just one of them, and you stay in a residency it doesn't have to be your own and you do not leave while intoxicated so technically house parties are completely legal if everyone's 18 or 16 and only drinks wine and has parents permission and no one leaves but that's where see i felt like this was great and i didn't remember that 16 it was only wine because i was i was thinking not hard alcohol till 18 but i was thinking like beer and stuff like that i remember one of your Uh, sisters it might I see that's what I remember. It but might something been, like that. Yeah. I didn't basically care I was eighteen. Basically when when all of you guys are sixteen, if you're in the house and we're having beer and you ask for one, I've said yes. Yeah. And um I think if you want to try something for the taste and you want to try something for how it feels, I would rather you have you do it in my house where I can watch safe. you and you're safe and you're not leaving. And so I had no issue with that because I understand the desire to experiment. And I also would understand what it feels like to have the edge of stress taken off when you just hit that point that you're buzzed. You're just a little tipsy yeah, and like you're that's sh- a fun point. Yeah. See I I, I appreciate that point myself. Um, I don't like being past that point, but I have that op- enormous discussion in our family at the dining room table because it was like, oh, okay. And I, I remember for a New Year's Eve party, one of the girls was invited by a friend and the mom said, is she allowed to have champagne at midnight? And I said, yes, she was 16. Yes, as long as she doesn't leave your house, she has my permission to have champagne at midnight if she chooses. I don't right. care if your shit stays drunk. Legal. Right. It's legal. Right. And um, that actually made it much more relaxed mm-hmm. as far as, because it, the law kind of backed up my personal belief, I guess. Mm-hmm. And it, I thought it was that. awesome. I thought it was awesome because I went into a debate and I was the only one that got a hundred percent. Like that's awesome. I was against like the smartest kids in class and they're all just here's my argument about why we should lower the drinking age. If we can join the military, we should be allowed to drink. Like, you know, the common arguments that teenagers have about it. And I'm just like, Well, you can. You just have to be smart about it. Here are the laws. And like, you're saying this to a class of 18 year olds and they're all just like, oh, what? Right. Wait. Wait. And then, yeah. then they were just like, uh, can we have your evidence? And I'm just like, sure. From a government website, <laughs> there's the laws. I highlighted the fun parts. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I want to make a point because we're talking about discipline. I think I'm a very understanding, relaxed, and mellow parent. I'm not out there where I'm smoking joints with my kids when they're teenagers. And I'm not like, I'm going to call that hippie. You know, I'm not permissive. I'm just not restrictive. So I understand that you guys are going to experience things. And I, I am open to being not restrictive and not permissive. I fall somewhere in the middle. I am definitely very understanding and I love oh, yeah. the open conversations. So I'm going to make one comment about weed because there are, I've had, some of you guys have struggled with depression and anxiety, suicide mm-hmm. attempts, the inability to sleep, high stress. And I look at the medications that are given prescribed for that. 
And if I can give one of my kids under age a choice of having some sort of medical marijuana or marijuana in general, if you can take a controlled amount of an edible to sleep and get rid of depression and anxiety oh, compared that to it be so nice compared to an Ambien. I mean, like the side effects on some of the medications that they're prescribing, including to our kids are so astronomically awful. And if someone can grow a plant and do the same thing and it's naturally based. So I'm, I was pro legalization just because I think alcohol is still worse. And so are cigarettes and the mm -hmm. medicinal benefits of weed are so great that I think it could replace a lot of pharmaceuticals. So that's where I'm yeah. at. Yeah. And like I've done my research on it. They have strands where you don't get nearly as high, but you get more of the medical benefits. Right. So it, it calms you down more, but you're not just like, woo, out there. And then they have strands that are the complete opposite where there's, it's purely for fun. It's recreational. Right. But there's not a ton of benefits. So it could go either way. There's multiple different strands of it. And how... I explained it to one of my friends because they didn't grasp it. I related it to like green beans. There's multiple different kinds of beans, but they're all beans. Right. There's multiple different types of buds, but they're all buds. Right. Because that's what they're I called. just, I find it fa scientifically fascinating and beneficial. And so <laughs> do I want you guys to go out and smoke it uh, all through high school? No. It's no. It's different. So here's the other thing I think as a parent, I want to talk about the discipline. Um, mm -hmm. If you guys got caught doing something or you didn't, you, you know, if you came to me, I wasn't one going to get you out of anything. There was, you still had to, hello, you, Pick up. <laughs> you still had to, <laughs> you still had to experience the consequences. Um, yeah. I was the, the first parent that would call the police, which I've done several times because the second you cross my line, the second you cross my line, you already cross it. You're it's done. The police are involved. I don't use them as a threat because I think they're mostly there to help people. And that's what they're doing. They're helping me and they're helping you. And you may not see it that way as the kid who has the cops called on them, but I have called the police on multiple occasions. So let me be really clear that I, I loved working with you guys in parenting, but the moment it hit the point to where we were out of your control, I am going to initiate other help. That includes, uh, that's been drug use, that's been behavioral, definitely. Um, there are certain behaviors that once they hit a certain point, and here's why. I'm a really great parent, and part of why I'm great at it and I'm an expert is because I know when to fly the white flag and ask for help because I'm not the best person to handle the situation. Uh, one of you guys had a suicide attempt, and I, I thought that was she, bad. That I thought she was sick, like physically had the flu or an appendix, or like I I didn't realize until we were in the doctor's office, and I I felt like intuitively something's not adding up, and I just looked at her and said, either you can tell me now, or we're going to have some sort of intervention because I know I'm missing something. And if it is what I think it is, we, we need to initiate us. Like I, I started to put together the fact that this was a suicide attempt and it wasn't that you were, that she, that wasn't you by the way, but that mm -hmm. wasn't, that oh, she, I, know. I wasn't saying you like you, it wasn't that she was well, sick from her appendix or something. This was actually uh, self harm. And I, and I remember that moment I was thinking, please, God, let me be wrong. please, please let me be wrong. And, but you know, you are not wrong. You, mm -hmm. you know, and, but I still needed the confirmation and then it all came spilling out. And because it was a suicide attempt with a minor, we had to transfer to the hospital. Um, it had to be in yeah. an ambulance. You know, I mean, we had to follow legal protocol and we got to the ambulance. I mean, we got to the ER and, you know, we left for the doctor's office at around four and around 2 a.m. So you're exhausted at this point and it's emotionally draining. And I had, now I'm a parent who I was licensed to teach foster parents with the highest level foster kids. So I taught suicide awareness and I had kids that had suicide attempts. You were one of them. Yeah. 
in this instance, the social worker came to me and said, okay, now that she's like, we, we're, she's good and we've caught it, are you comfortable taking her home? And I said, no, because I know statistically that if a first attempt is unsuccessful, when there is a second attempt, it is almost 100% successful. Mm -hmm. I, I am not willing, I can't watch her to that level. She needs help that clearly I'm not able to give. I, I think I'm a good parent because I know when to say that I'm not the best option. Well, for me, I helped you. Like I would go to the foster care place with you and I would, when I was bored, read the stuff. So like I read through like a briefing type paper about that stuff. So like I knew what these parents were getting taught, but because you know what they're taught and what they look for, you know what to hide. Mm -hmm. Oh, you so, were exemplary at hiding. You didn't know anything until after with you. Well after. And you only found out because I told you. If you had not... I mean, there are a lot of suicide attempts, which means you were not successful. Had I you been always it, the best. Had it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you're going to fail miserably at something, that would be a good thing. To I'm fail. okay. It's that. <laughs> so the thing is, is that, yeah, I was so trained that so were you guys at hiding it and that that was my downfall. I think I wanted to be so open with you that it actually made it easier for you guys to hide things, which of course wasn't my intent. Right. How, however, um, I, I know when I need help mm -hmm. and that includes just an absolute disrespect. And that's the hardest for me because it's verbal. There's not something you can put your finger on, mm -hmm. but, uh, definitely I, um, yeah, I know when something outside of me needs to happen. And I don't feel slighted by that because it's not possible to be everything to everybody. I, you can be an expert at something and still need help from people. So I don't tend to get mad and take things away. I want to hit it where it hurts. <laughs> Change know. the Wi-Fi password. Yeah. And turn off the data. Yeah. I mean, you don't, there are so many things as a teenager that are privileges. They are not rights. Mm -hmm. And um, I like, like, if you want to disrespect me, then this is what it's going to be like. If you think that you're ready to move out of the house, here's how much your cell phone <laughs> will cost. <laughs> I'm okay. still on your cell phone plan. Yeah, but isn't that great because oh, it's so it saves cheaper. you money. Mm -hmm. If you would like to pay me for it instead of getting your own and you're responsible about it, that's fine. Now, with one of your siblings who was not responsible paying me, all of a sudden well, one they were day just removed. <laughs> yeah, you don't have a phone anymore. I, I'm very clear with you guys about my expectations. If you want your cell phone and your auto insurance to be through me, because you it saves to, you money, you have to pay me by the state. I've been pretty good about that. You've been awesome about it. Um, so, yeah, you've been the easiest. And the stress for me is that I'm taking on a financial obligation that on my own I cannot afford. And if you don't pay me, it screws up my all my finances. I mean, it makes right. my life very difficult. So I'm taking on that financial, uh, I guess, stress to make it easier for you but the second you don't pay me you don't for it, it you you are cut off immediately well, yeah and you know I kind of like my phone so yeah that's a good motivation so what other things we've talked about sex drugs alcohol suicide attempts disrespect which is the hardest for me and and I just cutting you off if well, you don't follow the rules being open there was some times growing up where, like, you would send me to my room or take my phone away for the evening, and I'd be, like, I'd be getting reprimanded and in trouble, and I would just sit in my room and be like, had she let me speak out, or had I been able 
to tell her what was actually going on and explain the situation fully, I wouldn't be sitting here in trouble. Because parents know best, but almost to a fault sometimes, where, like, they know what to do. But if it's hard to know, like, how to do it, everything, how am I going to word this? I'm not good with words. Um, there were some times where I know I wouldn't be wrong, but you would treat me as if I was because you didn't know the full, un, the full story. You didn't understand it all because you wouldn't let me tell you. Oh, I wasn't open to the conversation. Well, you would be mad. Okay. And I'd be getting in trouble because I messed up, but I messed up on purpose to benefit something else for the better. I'm trying to think of a specific situation. I was just going to ask you that. Um, so were you the fall guy for someone else? Sometimes, yeah. And it'd be like, no, mom, yes, I, I hit them. Okay. But, like, there was one time when me and a younger sister were fighting over the remote, and you had said, it was my turn with the TV okay? because we had to take turns and they just would not give me the remote. So we wrestled for it and I ended up accidentally putting them in a headlock and choking them <laughs> while trying to reach for it. That doesn't sound like an accident. <laughs> well, no, it was because I didn't know. I didn't even know what a headlock was at the time. Okay. Okay. But like, I just had my hand on one shoulder and was behind her reaching for the remote and accidentally Got choked it. them out. And they went crying to you that I had choked them. And you came down fuming and yelled at me for choking someone. And, like, later that night, I went up to you after you had, like, cooled down. And I was just like, Mom, I never put my hands on their throat. I had my hand on her shoulder, and I was reaching around behind her to get it. And her neck was in my elbow. And then you kind of understood, but, like, I spent a couple hours by myself in my room because you wouldn't let me tell you that in the moment. But that's because you were mad and I understood after, well, a few years later. But there was other situations, like in high school, when, like, I would stay late for school or I missed the bus a couple of times. And you would be pissed because you had to take time out of your day to come and get me because I couldn't find a ride. And I'd be like, well, yeah, I, I missed the bus, but let me tell you why. But I wouldn't always say it like that. We'd be like bantering. But you would never let me tell you why. But it would be like I was talking to a teacher about a test and when to retake it or something like that. But you wouldn't know that. You would just know I missed the bus. And you would always assume that I was messing around with friends or something. So there were some times when I wouldn't be wrong. But what I was doing wasn't entirely right. But I wasn't wrong. I wasn't in the wrong. And you wouldn't know that because you didn't fully grasp the situation. So I didn't know the whole story. I didn't have all the mm -hmm. information and I reacted with the information I had. I mean, as a parent, I think that's probably pretty common. Yeah. And there, there's no excuse. Okay. I'm not excusing parents, right. but if I'm working full time and doing all the cooking and doing all the cleaning, I mean, we all had a chore wheel, but you know what I mean? And I'm getting people everywhere they need to be. I know for a period of time, we had kids in five schools. Oh, geez, that was, you fun. know, but, but when you're dealing with like what our normal life was and mm -hmm. you have 12 kids at home or 10 or three, I mean, really you as a parent, and I know kids don't understand this until they're adults, which sucks because as a parent, you're pulled in so many directions. You feel like you're failing every one of them in some way. Your boss wants you to work harder and better and more. Your kids want you around more and they, they want you to be able to buy diff better shoes, but you can't do that. Right. Put more time into it. You know, you feel, and I know the word for me is like, I, I felt shame that I couldn't do all of it exceptionally well all of the time. And 
there, that's not an excuse, but the thing that kids don't see growing up when in situations like this, where you're rightfully so disappointed that I didn't handle it like I should, is that it's really hard to just take that extra beat to figure out all the information and then make a decision based on that. It's mm -hmm. really, really hard to slow down that beat. And I can also tell you in probably at least eight out of 10 situations, it wouldn't make a difference. Like I was probably pretty right m a lot of the time. Well, yeah, but then there'd be a couple of situations where I'd sit in my room being like arguing, talking to the wall, but telling the full story going, if she would listen and I could tell her all this, I wouldn't be sitting in my room talking to myself. It's interesting because there were so many, at least just as many situations where I wish you had told me more, but you didn't. So, you know, the thing about parenting, being the kid and being the parent, and I remember feeling not understood and not listened to as a kid too. So that's probably fairly common. Mm -hmm. I'm sure I, it is. I think that, the parent doesn't take the time to really feel out or see the child's perspective and situation. And you don't have the ability to feel out and see the parent's perspective mm -hmm. and what's going on. And you don't know as a kid, the pressure of parenting. I don't think there should be a parenting manual. I don't think there's one right, what right way to do it. Although oh, I, think no. I parented you guys all with the same attitude. I took different approaches to different personalities. So, um, it's a, a, you feel like you're juggling and tight, tight rope walking the whole time you're parenting your kids. You just, to try to make sure you do it all. And I know, there's a couple things I know. One, all of you guys are pissed at me about something. And I, well. you know, I know that I'm a good parent and I look back and I think, okay, overall, I, I give myself, you know, a pretty decent score. I know what I would change. Um, and that's my volume. Maybe because of this conversation, I would have paused to listen a little bit more or say, is there anything you want to tell me about the situation that I don't know, which would be a great way to phrase it. Mm -hmm. I'm really mad because you were choking your sister. Is there anything about this situation? I don't know. It wasn't intentional. Right. I didn't put my hands on her throat. My hands were reaching for the remote. Right. So, I mean, yeah, there are things that we can do to be better as parents, and you don't know that till you're on the other side. Hindsight's twenty twenty, and you don't have it in the heat of the moment. But, oh no! But I also know there that remember the time that we all sat around the table, and you guys started telling me confession think, night. Yes. <laughs> Oh, we never planned those. When someone backed the van into the house and, <laughs> and then ran over the fence. And then ran over the fence and said, No, Don't tell mom. And none of you guys, none never. Of you guys, there were nine of you at that point in that vehicle. And none of you told me ever until later when she initiated the conversation. Nobody ever came clean and told me, you guys, what I was impressed with, with was with how loyal you were with each other. You didn't always like each other. You paired up differently in a big family. Um, you got on each other's nerves. You had to share more than you wanted to. You, you had to get hand-me-downs more than you wanted to. But you really, you really had each other's backs. You were very loyal to each other. You can... Oh, yeah. You can be pissed at a sibling and still know that if anybody else ever threatened them, you would, you jump in in a heartbeat. Oh, that's happened to me. Like I was right. pissed out one of the boys. Mm -hmm. Like they just, that morning I was just done. And then we got to school. This was when I was in fifth grade. Okay. And they were in fourth. And it was morning recess and I saw them about to get like beat up and I like sat down at first and was just like time to watch the show and then I was just like wait no if anyone gets to beat him up it's me so I went yep. st to the bully and was just like if anyone wants to beat my little brother up to a bloody pulp you gotta beat me up first because yep. only I can do that to him mm -hmm. and like then I turned and was just like get up and go to class I don't want to see you anymore <laughs> <laughs> like I'm so mad at you for this morning but I think as much as maybe in those moments, I didn't do the best job parenting. 
there were just as many moments you guys were hiding things from me. <laughs> just a little. Right. So, I mean, as you get older, you realize that all of that's a two-way street. And what I asked from you the most was honesty and respect. And if you lie to me or you treat me with disrespect, because I don't feel like as a parent I ever – was disrespectful to you. I was pissed sometimes. I gave consequences. I'm the first one to call the police when it's needed. I will give and give and give and give and everything's fine right up until you cross my line. And then I know I am not the same person. And I should I shouldn't be. I'm I'm mm-hmm. glad about that. Um but man if you disrespect me, that was but you know that's your big one. That is definitely my big one. And with teens and the attitude and the yelling at you and the talking back and the, it's so disrespectful. It sends me into a tailspin. I have to say it is my biggest trigger is being disrespectful. So yeah, that one's the hardest to deal with. And I would say the best thing that I do in parenting teens when I feel emotionally triggered is to shut the door and walk away. Mm -hmm. And um, the benefit of having phones is that you could be in the same house as I am, but I will text you. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes you need a little separation. And I like texting because you can type everything out. And think about it and process it and change it. And make sure it's correct and then send it. And then they receive it all at once instead of interrupting each other. I think one thing, I know one thing that I, there's a lot of things I hope I taught you. But one thing is that there's always someone you can go to and you can work through anything. And absolutely, unconditionally, I love you no matter what. It's hard now having you know, like 14 kids be adults and of the remaining four, one isn't in the house at all and hasn't been for a few years, but she was mm-hmm. long, she was for quite a few years. Yeah. Of the, of the other three, two of them are really, really, really close to being adults. The hardest yeah. thing for me is to see that you guys don't all uh, actually, what's great is that some of you are really close and have great relationships. Quite a few of you, actually. You are a little more removed. Yeah. Well, um, that yeah. that doesn't mean that people don't love you. I think we're not. Oh, I know they do. Right. From a distance. Yeah, I wish that was. And that's the other thing that I don't like is that there is. Um, distance between us. Yeah. It's really hard to see you guys not get along or not have contact more than like, I don't have great contact with every one of the kids as adults. Uh, most well, of them. Yes. Most of them I do, but a couple of, but them, not all of them. No, absolutely not. I don't. It's like, did I do a good job? Yeah. Do they like me and want to hang out as adults? No, we don't have, I do not have a good relationship or mm-hmm. I wouldn't say it's not good. I don't have much of a relationship with a couple of them. And that is by the child becoming an adult and making that choice. And I am fairly okay with that. I wish it were different. Right. I am also totally respectful of you guys as adults having that process. It's harder though, that you aren't close to each other. And I see that. That's. Eh, It happens. Yeah. And I love how. Yes. Okay. That's what, that's a great word. So, like, sometimes we're, like, super close and talking every day, and then we won't talk for, like, a year. But then, like, we'll run into each other. Like, they'll be with someone else that I happen to be messaging, and I'll be like, oh, my gosh, you exist. Mm -hmm. Message me. And then we start talking again. Yeah. But, yeah. So, it fluctuates. I think we've covered sex, drugs, alcohol, and rock and roll. I used to just be sex, drugs, and rock and roll when I, I guess alcohol's a drug. So there you go. Um, disciplining, mistakes, how to do things better, um, the discrepancy in kids, and my personal parenting style, which of course is what I prefer because it's what well, I do, which is not being obviously. restrictive and not being permissive. Um, 
Anything you want to add to listeners as a child? I think this is my personal views. I think it was easier for me when I was a teenager in your house compared to the teens in your house now, because it was easier for me to hide my mistakes and hide what I was doing Ah. amidst the chaos. The masses. And then if we're all making the same mistakes, the punishment's kind of delivered amongst all of us and it's lessened Mm -hmm. because we all have it. Right. But when there's just like one or two teenagers in the house and they make the same mistakes we were making, all of that is on them. So they get more of the same punishment because it's not doled out to multiple other people. So I think it's a little harder for them than it was for me because they don't have anyone else to pawn it off to or to share it with. That could be true. I also think that some of you have just been personality wise or behavior wise more difficult than others. Yeah. One of your sisters is, didn't get in trouble very much, but was one of the hardest personalities. Oh yes. So, okay. Does that make sense? So sometimes the, and that, and, and that's not a, that's not for this podcast really, but parents and kids don't necessarily have personalities where they really super like each other and click. And that's a really, really hard to parent a kid that doesn't like you or that you really just don't like. Um, where your personalities just the personality clash. clash. So it, it, I really feel like even though you were, I think you were good at hiding things and that's why you didn't get in trouble as much. You, you learned, like you said, you, I brought I you still along. learned. Yeah, I brought you along to all the foster care, and I loved doing that. And in that, I inadvertently taught you how to hide things that I would have not wanted you to hide. I mean, obviously, a suicide. Well, attempt. Yeah, but well, I didn't want you to know. Well, nobody does, but you know, I mean, I think you try as a parent to parent equally, like the same. Hmm but based on different personalities. And sometimes it's not the behavior, it's the personality that's a clash. And sometimes it's the behavior that's a clash. But I always wanted to show up 150%. And we can kind of end on this. And I know as kids, you want autonomy and you want independence. And sometimes 150% for the parent looks like a looks like 150% and you are a rock star. And sometimes it looks like a fraction, mm-hmm. you know, parent, but that's life. That's life. And sometimes, um, sometimes you're all is 10%. Sometimes it's 150. Right. And so I think you really try to do a good job, but I still, even talking to you guys as adults, <laughs> I still think you as kids and me as a mom did a pretty decent job. Yeah, I'd like to think I turned out all right. Yeah, I think you did. On that note, thanks Thanks for joining us. Oh, well, you're welcome. I have graced you with my presence once again. Thank you for joining us today on our adventure. We love engaging with all of you, so comment.